those of you who um, are not here, just wanted to kind of do a couple slides about the show. When Abby and I put the show together, um, we came at it from very different angles and sort of met in the middle, but the way I came at it was from the, um, the physical side of this narrative that we were telling, right? So artifacts and um, archeology span and history and the, you know, whereas Abby came from more of a literature and narrative, I don't know, narrative yeah. experience, yeah. So, um, but the big part that I contributed to this show was a um, archeological museum. Can you just click. Huh? Click. It's not clicking. Okay. Yeah. Just force click. Yeah. Okay. So um, my background is in anthropology and art history, which isn't what I studied in college, and has kind of kind of stayed with me. And eventually, got to the point where I realized I could incorporate my academic interests back into art. Um, so here we have. Okay. I'm gonna skip back and forth because I rearranged these a lot. We, <laughs> um, so we based this show around Heinrich Schliemann who was um, considered the father of modern archeology. span And that is something that we have been only debunking for the last like really 30 or 40 years. Um, there's a lot of reasons why his methodology was problematic. And like all sciences, they evolved a lot in the last 150 years to become what they are. So we talked a lot about, um, and if you haven't seen our artist talk from uh, last month, if you wanna find out more about the work in the show, that's on Craft Alliance's YouTube page. And you can learn um, a lot about the work we put into the show in relation to this. But what we wanted to talk about is in terms of archeology, span how much he missed. I'm gonna go back, I'll go forward. Okay, just a quick background on me and why I'm interested in this at all. Um, when I was in high school, I loved clay. I loved ceramics. I also loved Latin and history. And um, that's when I really started traveling. And that kind of all came back together after I graduated from college and realized I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I maybe didn't want to become a history professor. And I didn't know. Um, I eventually found my way back into clay and have since kind of incorporated my interests in the built environment, the cultural landscape into my own work. But I always had this like little itchy feeling of like really loving the antiquities for whatever reason, but they are a compelling thing. Um, Archaeology was kind of born from this rediscovery of the ancient world starting in the Renaissance, but then going into the neoclassical era. Um, Pompeii began to be excavated in the mid 18th century. And then this excitement kind of traveled around Europe um, and in a different way of viewing the past. Whereas, you know, in the dark ages, I mean, you'd just be chipping away at old things to rebuild what you needed to. And suddenly there was this heavier weight to it. And it also changed the way people traveled and how tourism kind of, as we know, it was born and the way things were displayed and collected and curated changed dramatically. But it all came back to this fascination with the ancient ancient world. And like so many other things, by the turn of the 20th century, things were starting to shape into the fields of research that we know them today, whether it's astronomy or physics or anthropology or biology. So what happened in archeology span in the United States is it kind of became a part of um, four subfields of anthropology. Um, and we normally talk about archeology span as like this uh, study of the physical cultural remains of the past, right? To better understand humanity as a whole. And it's a lot of things, right? We're digging things out of the ground and we're displaying them. So Schliemann's version of that in 1872 when he excavated Troy was finding the, the best, the treasure. I mean, archeologists in early days were treasure hunters. He certainly was. Some of his contemporaries were actually doing a responsible job in figuring out how to approach archeology span in a scientific way. He was not. So a lot of the things that he was most concerned about were gold and, um, and big museum worthy pieces that he could sell, that he could smuggle out of the country and then sell himself. Do you have a do you have a sense of um, what Schliemann's relationship was to ceramic artifacts? 
Oh, well, I mean, he encountered a lot of them. That's a good question. <laughs> um, so just to back up a second, when Schliemann excavated the mound that was Troy, there are about seven or eight layers of different settlements over a mm, three to 4,000 year period. So he was encountering, as most people did at any archeological site then, just shards of pottery everywhere. You're stomping on it, you're crushing it, it just is. It's like, there's as much of it as there is rock, you know? Mm -hmm. So he didn't care about that stuff. <laughs> um, he, he blasted through several layers of um, Troy and went down to a level that um, was several thousand years earlier than what he thought he was dealing with. And so there's a lot of stuff that was missed along the way. Um, this is just, I want to talk a little bit about my own interest in archaeological practices. When I was in um, undergrad studying anthropology, I knew that I really wanted to go on a dig. So I got to do my field school um, in Greece on a small island. And when I started, so in art history, when you get back to a certain point where it's not art anymore, it's just objects and we don't know how to interpret them in a way, you know, that's you know what I'm saying? Um, everything becomes art history, but in reality, a lot of the art that we're studying when we study past cultures is really just functional objects, everyday objects, and not works of art. Um, when I got into anthropology, because I thought that's what I wanted to study, I got really into bones. So that's bioarchaeology, which is not for some reason as part of the other subfield of physical anthropology, but they're all tied together anyway. So I ended up on a dig where we're excavating um, an ancient children's cemetery. And there are about 800 burials over, no, no, 2000 burials over a period of 800 years of neonatal remains in amphora. So it's babies placed lovingly in these um, basically trade vessels. <clears throat> And then we did individual excavations on them. So that was like this amazing moment. While I was in college, I didn't do any clay. So really the only time I handled ceramics wasn't my own, but it was these big pieces that other people made thousands of years ago, which was really remarkable. So would you define cultural anthropology as like more connected? Cultural anthropology is, um, that's what Scott does, mm -hmm. who gave a talk mm -hmm. actually to contextualize this show as well. So this is, but that's the thing, they're all related, okay. right? So archeology span contributes to anthropology to, to give physical evidence that helps create a bigger picture of what's going on. Which to me kind of defines art history past. Totally, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Um, just to step back. So when I designed, when I talked, pitched the talk, it was a huge topic <laughs> that um, I was thinking, well, how am I gonna narrow this down? So this is not going to be a history of clay throughout time around the world. I really wanted to zoom in on the region that we're talking about right at um, the moment that Troy, the real city did fall. Um, so this is, we're looking at the Eastern Mediterranean and these um, were the cultures that were active during the late Bronze Age, which is when Troy um, Schliemann's Troy, the Troy of the Iliad fell. So we're gonna kind of stick with Bronze Age stuff here. So because there's so much pottery, it becomes really, I and mean, I can't make a, a guess, but like 90% of what you're finding that's human material remains is clay because of all the mediums that, um, that were used to make useful things, fiber disintegrates, wood rots, metal corrodes, and ceramic can last a very long time. So the archeological record is definitely tilted towards there's just more clay out there. Um, and so we've been able to use ceramics to help define time periods, historical time periods, and to help um, figure out how things, how things age and how old they are in any given site anywhere. So what are some of the methods that are used to kind of place ceramic objects on a timeline? Oh, sure. Well, so in archaeology, generally, there's different ways that you date things. And there's absolute dating where you can actually know when it's from. Then relative dating has a, there's a bunch of different ways to date something relative to something else. And then you have all of these timelines and ceramics, especially in, a, in Greece where we know everything that was made. If you take something, you know, comparatively how old it is by, is it older than this? Is the style from this period or is it the one they were doing before? So pottery for 
Greek archaeology creates its own timeline that people can reference in order to figure out, you know, how old something is. Um, as an aside, with radiocarbon dating, you can actually find organic material in some ceramics if it was the side of a pot that wasn't actually getting as hot as other things out, other parts of it did. Um, so you can find, you can radiocarbon date, things like that. And you can also find out a lot. Well, maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves because you're going to find oh, out yes, yes, yes. more That's things later. Later. from clay scraps, right. But it's the big pieces that we think of. When we think of Greek pottery, we're thinking big museum worthy pieces, but those were obviously only a fraction of what people were using every day. And a lot of that is scraps. Now these are fake scraps. These are part of the things that Abby and I created for the show, which I'm hoping to confuse the archeological record <laughs> for the next <clears throat> But what can a scrap of pottery tell us? The left is a, is a little chunk, is like we said that Schliemann wasn't that interested in, um, in these little things, right? He didn't catalog all the scraps of clay he found whereas now every single thing would have to be documented. But every now and then through his, um, <laughs> I mean, you flip through his, his book, which he published about what he found at Troy. And occasionally you'll get, I mean, you'll get a nice big pot that's really unique. Occasionally you'll get scraps, but only if they're really interesting. So on the left, he was able to see that, um, okay, there's a little chunk of Egyptian hieroglyphics there. So being able to catch that or the design or something that gives you a, a sense of what the whole thing might've been. But other than that, it's just bits and pieces. But now with the way things have come in only 150 years, what we can tell from pottery fragments now is amazing. I already mentioned radiocarbon dating from organic material that might remain after firing. Um, you, can also, you can also see trade routes by what the clay is tempered with. So in ceramics, you temper clay with ground up ceramic or bone or shell. And if you can take bits of shell from a clay body, then you can identify if it was marine shell or freshwater shell. And then you can figure out like if you find a pot, let's say in, Missis in Missouri that has a marine shell temper in it, then you know that they were trading at least all the way to the coast. So current research with um, clay scraps, I mean, in, Archaeology in general, as it's become a more organized science and every single scrap of everything counts, um, we're finding new ways to analyze the data collected that is pottery fragments. So now, instead of just looking at it and being like, this is red clay, or this clay might have come from here, possibly, we can tell a lot more with um, electron scanning microscopes and um, all these really interesting ways that we're looking at production techniques rather than just the artistic uh, style of the piece. And that's really important because in this period that we're looking at where we're looking at it in the late Bronze Age Aegean um, is when the pottery wheels developed. So that was only 3000 years ago and it traveled around and there's lots of contemporary archeologists who are researching how it traveled through those trade routes, how the technology changed, which is way more interesting, I think, than just seeing big museum worthy pieces is knowing how uh, craft and how industry transformed through trade and through the trade of objects, but then also through the trade of skills. So before, let's see what's next. I think I'm gonna go. Okay, so before wheel throwing, uh, pinch, pot, pinch pots and hand, or hand built pots with coils were the main ways to make large pots. So the first things that were made on a wheel were still coil pots. Um, and it would be a combined method then when the wheel emerged of coiling and wheel throwing. And I should have gotten some. What's the clay body you think they were oh, using? Oh, I mean, anything and everything depends on the place. But um, right. so did you anything. notice a difference through the layers or? through the place it was found. That's actually, you know I mean? that's too good of a question. So oh, that's someone's sorry, dissertation sorry. and we'll probably dig, we'll, we'll dig it up and find that. Okay, we'll have wine chat in a couple of Wine chat long. about <laughs> clay body. But I mean, Almost we do know body, things that like in that part of the world, they're mainly using earthenwares and stonewares. Sure. Yeah, okay. so there's not gonna be any porcelain. In yeah, this I was thinking here. that, yeah. yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what's so fascinating about clay and oh my gosh, about yeah. different bodies of clay. I mean, as we've talked about before, clay is such, and such a compelling thing to me because it can you can approach it from history 
art, geology, you know, all of these things. So for this exhibition, were you interested in replicating a certain style? Yeah, so in the exhibition, a lot of the things that I made are, are replicas of things that he found in his excavations. That yeah. he decided to keep. Now, I wasn't being, <laughs> sure. Well, not the clips, he didn't hear about that, right. But, um, but I did not, I mean, if we had had 10 years and yeah. a lot of funding, maybe I could have learned the firing techniques and gone to Turkey to uh, source some- <laughs> You still some, got time, you still got time, grant writing. Source, <laughs> grant writing, yeah. Source the clay and do it all correctly. But that does lead me into this, which is that in archeology, span which has many, many subfield disciplines, one of them is called experimental archeology, span which a lot of people know of, you know, when you watch a show and everyone gets together and figures out, well, how could we build Stonehenge if we didn't have the use of X, Y, Z tools? And then you figure it out. So experimental archeology, span you're basically trying to recreate what was going on to create these physical artifacts, right? So there's this really cool marriage between ceramics and experimental archaeology where people get to make pots to figure out how pots were made which I don't know why that wasn't my career I need to and go back in time would, and how would restoration fall into that does mm, it or is it not totally really separate I think that would be a separate thing but then that would be why you catalog all the scraps of clay because in you're not restoring things but they're added to collections where then they can be used for research later so this is just an example I just wanted to show I pulled this from somebody's paper because I was just blown away by, oh yeah, when you look at things, these they tell you a lot. And especially in this time period when people are switching from building by coil to the wheel, because then you're gonna know by analyzing every single scrap of clay, was this, was this a coil pot? Was this a wheel thrown pot? And when I was doing this research, I was looking through and there's all these very technical sciencey sounding terms for things that if you, any of you are ceramic artists happen all the time in your pots, like dragged inclusions, which sounds really fascinating, but it just means the grittiness that's on the surface and it gets wiped in a certain direction, which direction is that wipe going in? So for um, a wheel thrown pot, if there's any grit, any of that grog that's in the clay, it's gonna, Kind of circle around the pot and there'll be horizontal layers on each other but in hand building you're going every which way so those drag conclusions might not be in one direction only so this is, is yeah so that would tell you so let's say you found a, a scrap from a place where you where you thought that they hadn't gotten the wheel yet it hadn't wasn't developed it wasn't part of their industry but you find um you find a scrap of pottery and it has these dragged inclusion lines maybe going around. Well, then you know, okay, well, but then was this vessel traded? Did they do it there? And then that's when you get into the figuring out what kind of clay it was. You just went traded. I know, right. So <laughs> it's a big puzzle. Um, but one of these cool things I stumbled upon as I was researching this is how, like what's going on in the field now and what people are learning about. And I. Uh, stumbled upon the research of these three women who um, are used coming at this from three very different ways to help figure out how we can tell the things we can tell from clay. So there's an archaeologist who's doing experimental archaeology. Um, we're doing 3D modeling and scanning, and then also like really detailed analysis of what's making what I'm, the clay is. I'm also assuming that the marks on the clay as far as glaze or I, that's all. Yeah, yeah. All and absolutely. the nice thing, not nice, whatever, when we're looking at this uh, time period is there weren't glazes as we know them now. To finish the pots, there's a lot of burnishing, which is when you really mm. smooth out that outer layer to, to get right. it water, like less porous. Um, but yeah, but then that does come into play later on. Okay, so this is how, how detailed it gets when they start to figure out how this method changes, right? So there's this transitional period where you're coiling and then you're still throwing on the wheel. And they're able to go back and recreate the process of throwing this way or of creating pots this way. Which is interesting because you also see this in parts of Asia. Oh yeah. You know, and then, this, that, this technique. So it's mm -hmm. just interesting how information gets. Or it was just figured out in a lot of different yeah, places yeah. at the same time. Because like we said, one of the first ways to create pots was pinching. 
and coiling, right? But then you realize when you're in, if you've ever taken a ceramics class, when you're doing a really large coil pot and you have to keep moving it and picking it up and turning it, it's really annoying. You're walking around your table and you're like, man, this would be nice if it was turning on its own. And then you have really nice banding wheels in our studio, you can plunk them on top of and turn them. But what people would do is they'd start building and maybe the inside of a broken pot that has a curve or like the inside of a gourd or something like that that they can turn. Oh, and then it makes it a lot more efficient to coil build. And then that was the premise of, oh, it's really handy if we have something that spins around. Yeah. For those of us who are into clay, what's a pinch cut? Oh, pinch cut. So you've probably done it though, even if you're not into clay in kindergarten with you know, Play-Doh. So you take a ball of clay. Oh, yeah, and you stick your thumb in it and then you just start pinching it to make a pot. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then coiling where you're rolling out coils and you're, you know, spinning them and stacking them on top of each other and then joining them. Because this is development. Yes, yeah, so it's the, so the pitch pot is less something. Than yeah. The pot. Yeah, exactly. That's, okay. I mean, in general, yeah, I'm sure they were probably developed at the same time, but if you need a quick, if I needed a quick clay thing, then I'd make a pinch pot. Coiling takes longer. Um, and then, of course, the pottery wheel completely revolutionized everything because then you could make pots extremely quickly, which transformed a lot of different industries. Let's see. Okay, so this is another thing where they're using, and this is where things kind of go over my head in terms of the technology. But basically, if you can analyze the insides of these pots to figure out, and this is one of the ones that the scientist made, right? But you can see all of these things, you just look at the cup, you can't see anything. But when we're looking at it with UV light on top of, I don't know if it's a stain or something, you can see all of these little things that come out that tell you how a vessel is made. And even things that don't seem that important, but are really cool, like sponge marks, or, you know, in my work, did your wedding band accidentally like knock into it or fingernail marks or even fingerprints sometimes is really fascinating. So the vessels that you excavated and you found the babies in them, because mm -hmm. that, we just kind of glazed over. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> right, yeah. but right. Are we, did you study if those were thrown or why they would make vessels that yeah. size? Or, well, I mean, because everything has a reason at this Everything point, has right? a reason, not yeah. not like us in material culture, we just collect. Sure, yes and no. So the thing about Amphora is they are, you know, the Amazon cardboard box of antiquity. I mean, they're used for <laughs> everything and you've had them around and you might have broken ones kicking around or oh, ones that you hadn't treated back or whatever. So when you have a site like that, which is of course really unique, sometimes you'll find a bunch in a shipwreck and you know exactly what they were doing. But in this case, there's a lot of styles that are different. Mm. They come from all over the place from a lot of different time periods. Um, and the interesting thing about that dig, which was done through the bioarchaeological team who's dealing with the bones. And then in Greece, all of the um, archeological work is done in government departments and they wanted the pots. So what we would do is just remove the, um, basically conduct an excavation that takes all the other stuff out and then hand the pots back over to them because that's really important for them. How do you feel about that? Separating the bones from the pot? That's, that's another conversation we could get into for, um, <laughs> well, I know we're never talking about, well, I, mean, this I know is ethics and archaeology. And being and, a mom and a woman, I mean, I think oh, there's no, so true. much that's layered into yeah. What, yeah. We, what we did and how we true. thought we were doing the right thing. I mean, we did yeah. that. So Stephanie's bringing up the nature of um, the dig that I worked on where we're removing infant burials, you know, and, and what does that mean, like ethically, right? Um, so the interesting thing is that on this island and in a on a lot of Greek islands, there's not a lot of space. So you bury your dead for um, a few years and then you have a cer ceremonial process where you dig them up and you wash their bones lovingly and pack them back up and then store them in an ossuary. So um, in this case, when we're doing that with the baby bones, we're cleaning them and being very respectful and they're very delicate and you're giving each bone has its own little padded envelope and you're categorizing them and collecting them and putting them in a new box. It just takes up less space than the original burial. And then they can be used. I mean, yeah, it's the largest collection of um, neonatal skeletons in the world. So it can be used for a lot of research. So culturally, mm -hmm. were there any um, through lines as far as, you know, this was done with maybe not the rich, but maybe the working class who couldn't oh, sure. store their well, stillborn and they had the Amazon 
box to put it in. <laughs> right. No, actually not. This would have taken a great deal of care, not mm -hmm. to be too morbid, but I mean, infant well, life was not as valuable yeah. then. So um, this is not normal. And I would think that the advancement yeah. in birth, birthing has probably evolved since. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So there's all that with child mortality, but also this is a cemetery that was active for a really long time. Um, and it's just not something that's seen. Hmm. So there is probably some sort of greater significance. People, these were not, there's not enough babies on this island over the last, you know, over time that are something less something crazy was going on. These are people who are bringing these probably offerings. So there's probably some significance there, but they're still figuring that out. Yeah, I just think yeah. it's so fascinating it really to is learn really something about human culture that we don't even think yeah. about today. Yeah. Or would think about putting in a ceramic, I mean, cereal goes in a ceramic. Sure. Right. No, totally. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. And so this is another, um, they're doing some 3d modeling here, or I think 3d scanning to then later on model and recreate different, um, recreate surfaces that then can be studied further. And I think that's the last slide because this is, yeah. Yeah. I but would, would, yeah, yeah. So we're going to do, I'm going to jump back a few, but then I also, let's see. Okay, you have questions? No, did you have something? You no, I'll go for it. I was going to ask, like, you know, you're working in a, in, a, in a medium that has this really, that, as you say, like ceramic is a material that survives and that yes. tells us a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, in, you know, in this presentation, you specifically reference like this moment of realizing that in your work, you make this art, this mark on clay that scientists are now looking at ancient, you know, sure. pieces of ceramic and seeing these same things. So there's this sort of connection between, you know, what, how the marks you're making, the work you're making now, and these, yeah. and these like very significant, very precious, very cataloged, informative objects. Yeah. And not that that's something you're in touch with every second of the meal, that would be exhausting, but like, how do you sort of <laughs> like parse that or reckon with that and oh, what you gosh. make and how you make it? Oh, that's a really great question because there, sometimes you wonder like, is my hobby contributing to extra waste? You know what I mean? And I mean, of course, this is not a hobby for me anymore. It's a profession, so I can feel a little less guilty about that. But I wonder, a lot of ceramic artists consider those like the environmental implications and stuff like that. But I think that when, you know, I don't know, our alien overlords are looking <laughs> through our trash in 3,000 years, I mean, there's going to be, the only thing that's going to last longer than ceramic is plastic. So it's going to be interesting to see how that works. Plus, I would think it would disintegrate, but according to my I, I mean, no, I don't know. I'm not here a forever. plastic scientist. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I, just, I just, I mean, but even just thinking that ceramics last longer than we think it does. Oh, right? yeah. 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 Tens and tens of thousands of years. Yeah. Because the first uh, ceramic objects that I think we've found are at least 30,000 years old. I'm looking at you. Yeah. Yeah. About right. Yeah. So, and that's just probably because that's when people started firing the stuff that they were making out of clay. But I think even before that, it was viewed as still like a really durable thing, even before it was fired, right? Um, just because of the, the way it holds itself together. So your, that question, I think about that a lot in terms of um, the amount of stuff. I mean, okay, so in the last 150 years, it's not just industry, it is hobby. It is people exploring craft in a different way. Kind of like we were talking about before, you know, the craft mediums of wood and metal and fiber and clay were kind of, you know, as artists and it was, you know, whatever industry people were working in that were working with it. And now it's open to everybody and we can all make terrible pots that we can trash, you know, and we can all do this. We can all like create this, this physical stuff that because we have free time because of, you know, all of the industrial advancements we've had. So there's going to be a big shift in the record, I would imagine, of all this extra stuff, but that's across the board. There's a lot of extra stuff that we make nowadays compared to, you know, very recent past. So approaching this show, knowing that you were interpreting a time and place, mm -hmm. but you are also an artist, mm -hmm. and the time and place lasted as a moment, but as you walk through the exhibition, your artist shines way beyond Schliemann's treasures. So how did you approach that? Do you mean the work that's not necessarily part of the, the yeah, replicas? Yeah, you started or? in the beginning of the show as like recreating a museum, but then it's mm -hmm. definitely you oh, and sure. Abby's voice coming through every step yeah, of the way. Okay, so did so you that's... feel as someone who knew this stuff? It's kind of like when you learn the rules, you feel like you can break it. Like, mm -hmm. did you feel as an artist that you could wave that free flag and do whatever you wanted? Absolutely. Or did you feel guilty? Not at all. So. <laughs> 
one of my absolute favorite things about creating work for this show, as we mentioned, we haven't gotten a walk through. There's areas of the show where the ceramic stuff is not just a replica of something that could have possibly existed. Um, Abby and I both wove in a lot of our own personal histories and um, observations and things into the imagery and the, the physical work of the show. So one of my favorite things that I got to make was just taking mundane things, whether it's pages from notebooks or even emails and creating them, creating a physical ceramic version of them. Um, so I have, you know, porcelain slabs that have screen printed um, emails that I sent 10 years ago on them. And some of them are displayed in a certain way. Some of them are crushed up and are part of other work that's made. Um, so yeah, that's a really fun way to kind of um, look at that medium and play around with it. Yeah, and create absolutely. something that especially now when so much of our world is, when we were talking about we have so much more stuff, but also the really important stuff is no longer tangible. I mean, so all those emails that are in my email archives are going to live gonna, forever on ceramic. Where are they? <laughs> but they can live forever on you ceramic, right? See your so text. everyone should print out their old <laughs> emails on <laughs> <just> porcelain <laughs> for posterity. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I also feel like you guys paid homage to the ceramics that maybe Schumann might have thrown away because to him it wasn't yeah. um, the capitalism wealth he was looking for. Sure. So you guys yeah. had to elevate that. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, that's actually a really good point. And we were talking about this earlier too, is that um, often, let's say, the mundane everyday work, not the, the big art pieces or whatever, but just like all that everyday stuff. And you and I have been talking about how a lot of that is like traditionally women's work, mm -hmm. right? So he was digging through layers and layers and layers and finding so many spindle whorls. So many spindle whorls. Do I have a picture? I don't know if I actually included them or not. Hang on. Let's see. Yes. Okay. He was overwhelmed by them. There were so many and they're not interesting because we all know what they do. Um, so in weaving and also loom weights, there were a million of them. So on the left are his, um, his drawings of ones that he found on site. The middle is, um, a lot of them collected in the Troy Museum in Turkey. And then the ones on the right are ones that I replicated, but things like that were, you have so many of them and they're not that interesting, but they're very important to everyday life. And I think that's one of the biggest things that how archaeology has transformed is that we're not looking for the king's treasure you know right. anymore we're looking for what were the subsistence strategies how are people finding fuji yeah. who are they trading with how did this work why were people moving from place to place and all of these questions that weave into a greater like fabric of understanding of why people do the things that they do and how people move around yeah so, yeah given, given the when do you start seeing evidence of repair? Of what? Of repair. Of repair? Yeah, like somebody glued a handle back on, you know, a piece that, that was broken. Interesting. Can you repeat the questions? So people yeah, can so Peggy was asking about um, where we see um, repairs in ceramics and, and stuff like that, and whether there was time taken to do those kinds of things. Um, and I would wager that with a lot of this kind of stuff, you're not repairing it. You know, once it's broken, it's done, nothing's precious. No pot is precious. It's just, you know, if you accidentally rip the handle on your cardboard box you're going to use to move with, you just get another cardboard box, you know. So um, I know that different cultures do deal with those kinds of things in different ways. Um, but I think mostly, I mean, pottery is pretty mundane. You know, I'm sure if they broke something that was very precious, they might repair, but I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know, know enough about the repair, huh? It's not like they have Gorilla Goo. They <laughs> don't have the, the E6000, which I like to use. Yeah. 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 I don't know. And I don't know how that survives in the record. I mean, I think, and a lot of us know the Japanese method of um, Kintsugi, um, where you use, you use a resin. Um, and then line it with gold to fix broken pottery. And um, but that's more of a, you know, for a precious piece or more of a ceremony, like, you know, thing, but not necessarily for functional. Like you don't want to put a broken pot back together to use it for your coffee, because that's a disaster, you know? And same <laughs> with if you're transporting a lot of olive oil, like you just don't, it's, you get a new one. So Do we have any questions from? Oh, not from chat. From I chat, okay. Oh, yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking about the baby's bones, 
So do we know whether bone lasts longer than clay? Did they, they have just been buried? Did they decompose? Good Was question. Clay was? Um, and I should know the all the answers <laughs> those dates, but um, it depends on the environment. You know, it depends on humidity and um, a lot of things. And I don't know, I mean, bone lasts a really long time, um, but just like with clay, it, you know, eventually erodes. And um, things can also become, I mean, we think about fossils. Sarah, I'm gonna keep, <laughs> I'm like, mm, it's like vaguely geological. Do you have answers for me? Petrification. Yes. Okay. So if you guys didn't hear that, um, Sarah was talking about how fossilization works where the or organic yeah. components of your, of bones are basically being um, swapped out, replaced, right, with um, other more permanent molecules. Yeah. <laughs> like science. Yeah. Um, right. Sure. Right. Right, right. <laughs> um, and then, and then with with clay, I mean, yeah, it's going to eventually, you know, it's subject to erosion depending on the firing techniques. And a lot of the firing that we're talking about is not as high temperature wise that we're doing now, which is really vitrifying things. Um, things will break. If you think about, you know, terracotta flower pot, which is low fired, um, that is like you know, 30 years old, it's been sitting on your front porch forever. It starts, you know, how it gets really wet, it kind of starts, and that can happen. So, um, but some of the things in that, like the firing techniques we have now, do make things, they're gonna last a lot longer. Yeah, any questions? Uh, well, I- to put you on the spot. Oh, no, 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 I, no. I, <laughs> I, I wanna <laughs> ask, I wanna like cue you up for, for something that you're excited to talk about. Oh, so if you wanna, you. if you wanna pass over this, you're welcome to, but like, you know, Schleeman's sort of, in passing, like made notes about like, yeah, ceramic is boring, but like, this is kind of a cute spin the wall, like draw this for you kind mm -hmm. of, right? But did he, I mean, um, <laughs> like <laughs> as the father of archeology, span like did he do anything that was helpful? Did he like figure anything out that was worth anything? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, we, we also know he took over this research from someone else who had already discovered Troy and was doing more methodolog met methodical mm -hmm. dig. And he took it over from him. I mean, here's what I will say about him. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> like, and here's the answer to that. Nope. No, not at all. Um, he, he helped to popularize this. I mean, in his publications, which were full of terrible, terrible, like just a lot of storytelling and false information, whatever. But um, he was really charismatic and he was a showman and he knew how to get out in front of a lot of things. He was a great marketing and PR rep for himself. I mean, he was amazing at that, right? So he was really kind of propelling that, that continuation, that interest in studying past cultures and the physical remains of things and digging things up and getting that excitement going where then eventually things did develop into the science that archeology span is today. Um, but I mean, that's the thing. He was just kind of, he brought attention to it. He was a showman and he wasn't necessarily contributing to anything, you know. So he was an Instagram influencer for hashtag. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yes. Oh gosh. <laughs> Schleeman had a social media account. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. Good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So um, how do you see this body of work in this you allowed yourself to dive back into, even though your pottery practice has always been about place and mapping, mm -hmm. but you really allowed yourself to dive back into yeah. maybe a past life, air quotes. Ooh. How how has this affected your artistic practice? Ooh, that's like how do you want it to affect? Well, yeah, no, and Abby and I talked a lot about how building the body of work for the show did kind of transform what we were already doing for ourselves anyway. So. Um, I mean, I make functional work. I make lots of mugs and lots of planters and lots of things like that, that um, it was really fun to- Break them? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it was great to be able to, cause I don't have a reason to, except for demos when I'm teaching, make things that are a little weirder mm. or try to replicate yeah. something or try to copy something or use a different clay body cause I'm kind of set in what I've been making. So it was really fun to be able to get in there and, and 
make things that I don't make, you know, and, and know that I can. That was the other fun thing about that. And then also along the way with a lot of the, um, I mean, I really love studying circus design and ceramics. It's something I really like to teach as well. So we kind of created, I have a whole new um, repertoire of techniques under my belt from this, which I think mm -hmm. I will bring into a future body of work. Yeah, I feel like there's also a few new forms that came out, like the flat vessel or working flatter versus in the round. Mm, not you would not so or... much, although we did get to do some more sculpturally things that were fun. But basically, I did lots of smashing of things and then rebuilding and mosaic. Oh, yeah, and stuff. I mean, so I think that's really it was great. Abby yeah. could not handle it because so I would be stressful. like, I know, because I'd have a pot and I would usually. I had experimented with throwing the things, letting it get bone dry, and then smashing it and then firing it because it would take up less room in the kiln that way if I had a lot of it to do. <laughs> but then I realized when I'm doing that, like just like things are gonna work a little bit. If I have a, a rim and I fire it and then I smash it, I can put it back together and it fits perfectly together. But if I smash it before it's fired, even if it was completely bone dry and no longer warping, it would still, depending on the angle that was, in the kiln leaning up against something or just in a pile, they would warp ever so slightly. They weren't really part of the same object anymore. So I had to do a lot of smashing once things were made, which Abby hated. <laughs> I was like, no, Abby, remember, no pot is precious. <laughs> it's fine, but it she shuddered every precious. time they had to smash something. Uh, yeah. When you don't make, when you don't work in ceramics, it all seems terrifying. But I'm sure it does. I think I'm gonna go back to the, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Oh, where was that? All those scraps. There we go. Yeah, that was the best. Ah, yeah. yes, all the bits. Mm -hmm. The bits. Which my husband is in the audience and can attest <laughs> to the fact that there's uh, little bins and jugs and things all around the house and the yard that have surprise smash pottery in them. <laughs> that will never uh, go which away. will never go away. So, yeah. Um, this is, this is. I just walked through the show with a friend of my mom's who um, connected actually like our body of work, which I, in a way I hadn't thought of to St. Louis and kind of our local history of mm -hmm. um, that the location of the arch was actually like a, a native settlement that had a lot of artifacts that we didn't particularly care about um, yeah. when the arch was built and that in fact that was a location that was sourced for um, bricks and for you know other sort mm -hmm. of functional objects and so yeah. these sort of um shards uh these bits of ceramic in particular have found their way into like people's backyards and you yeah. know sort of mundane strange places in our city yeah um that you know I, I you know in your archaeological practice would have been very carefully like cataloged and noted and photographed and like in in this other context in this other place maybe of a culture that we don't for whatever reason consider in the same way that we do kind of like sure. roman cultures like I mean, this is a moment where I get to say it was capitalism all, all along. along. Yes, <laughs> I'm watching a, a pod or listening to a podcast and where they debunk things, but um, and the answer is always that it was always capitalism. capitalism. So, in archaeology and where it gets, um, I would say that our concern for past cultures, like and respect for and all of that. We would all say that, yeah, we love studying that. We, we see the, well, maybe not everybody, but we see the value in, in these things and these objects, but that sort of ends when it's really inconveniencing me because I'm trying to build a property or build a yeah. big park or doing yeah. whatever. So the dig I worked on, the reason it was uncovered was because someone had just brought that nice edge of the cliff site to build a new boutique hotel. Wow. And so then there's that moment where it's like, you find something and like, do you tell anybody? And I think that happens a lot in places that have been inhabited for, you know, tens of thousands of years um, because there's stuff everywhere and it's a major inconvenience, but <laughs> it's a choice. Like, do we, is this just a, a scrap of pottery? We can bulldoze this into the sea and no one's going to notice. Then you're like, nope, wait, this is actually a thing. And now we have to stop. So especially with things like that, of just taking a site and deciding that it doesn't belong to anybody now you know, is something that happens a lot and happens with historical archaeology, which is what we call like, it, not prehistoric archaeology, um, even just excavating areas of cities, you know, that have been inhabited in the last couple hundred years, mm -hmm. cemeteries, moving cemeteries, you know. Do you think we're getting more responsible about it? Are governments more aware of it? Or you think it's yeah, still I mean, so quite prevalent? It's a good question. I mean, I think that just because there's so much more 
information is more readily available about everything that we're doing everywhere. I mean, there's no way, I don't think you can get away with that kind of thing as much as you could. Well, specifically, but then of course, as you know, there's so many issues that it's like all the information is there. We know this is happening and also we don't care and we're going to let it go. So, I mean, I think there also was specifically legislation that happened in the 1970s that kind of updated our like United States treatment of native objects um, mm -hmm. with to somewhat bring it to the reverence that we consider for like, you know, yeah. um, so, so insofar as I don't, I think when the arch was built, it was not, it was more fine to you know, shove yeah, that stuff away and not sure. pay attention. I think now if you find a native artifact, it's the same thing. You stop and you have to call in kind yeah. of archaeologists to evaluate what you found and decide if you're allowed to dig there. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure not that there aren't loopholes and exceptions, but I think that did kind of change yes, in the last, definitely. In the last a lot years. more regulation with that now. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Um, let's put the screen back on so I can include. I want to thank everybody who came to be in our audience. Having your energy here is just so great.